Are you glad you're here today? Could you please put a smile on your face? You'll increase your face value if you do that. Hallelujah. Are, would you rather be here than the best hospital in Northern Virginia? Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Would you rather be here than the best jail in the state? Can I see your hand? Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Well, I want to share with you something from the Word of God in the time that I have today. Praise the Lord. And I want you to open your Bible with me. Yes, we are going to preach from the Bible this morning. From Hebrews chapter 10. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 19. Praise the Lord. And while you're turning, I'm just going to pray. Father, I thank you for this precious church. I thank you for these beautiful believers. And I pray today that by your spirit, you'll speak to our hearts. We ask you today that he that speaks may speak as the very oracles of God. And may that he that minister do so with the ability that you furnish so that Jesus Christ may be glorified in all things. To him belong the dominion and the power forever. I pray that every heart would be an open heart, every mind would be an attentive mind, every ear would be a listening ear to the sound of your word. We give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. And somebody said amen. amen. Hallelujah. Are you here today? Yes. All right. Don't feel afraid. If you feel like getting happy, that's okay. If you feel like shouting, I'm giving you permission right now. Hallelujah. If you are blessed, it's okay to show it. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm not going to stare at a photograph today. You've got to enter into the presence of God. Are you here today? Hallelujah. Come on, my grandmother can do better than that. She's dead. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. And I'm going to actually read a passage of scripture here beginning in verse 19, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. And actually, I've never uh, taught this lesson or preached this message before, but this just seemed to be what was on my heart as I was preparing and studying, and so we're just going to go with it and trust God that it's all going to work out just fine. Praise the Lord. In other words, I didn't just pull out a file out of a, out of a, out of a, uh, a box or something. This, just, this is what I've got. Praise the Lord from the Holy Ghost. Amen. So notice with me Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus by the new and living way that he has inaugurated for us through the curtain that is his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast, hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful, and let us be concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works not staying away from our meetings, and that means tonight, but as some habitually do, but encouraging each other, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Praise the Lord. I want to look at this passage of Scripture. This, these verses tell us that we have something, what belongs to us. What do we have? It says in verse 19, we have boldness. Somebody say boldness. boldness. We have boldness to enter into the holy place. The Amplified Translation says, we have full freedom and confidence to enter into the Holy of Holies. So it's not just talking about the sanctuary, meaning you have boldness to come and sit down here in church. So that's not what he's talking about. You see, the blood of Jesus gives us access to the presence of God. And so this morning, I feel led to go this way. I want to talk about the presence of God. I believe that there should be a deeper hunger in our hearts for the presence of God. I believe that we've reached a place where we cannot be satisfied with just going to church and having services and having meetings. I believe that what we really desire is a greater reality of God in our lives. And I believe the world is not going to be changed just because we have good intentions or even well-designed programs. I believe people need to see the glory of God manifested in the lives of believers. I believe that this world, especially in America, they've heard about Jesus, but it's time for them to see Jesus manifested through his body. Can I get an amen? amen? Glory to God. 
So we have boldness to enter into the presence of God by the blood of Jesus. Now see, the problem is many people are trying to approach God apart from the blood. Amen? Are you listening to me? Now, under the old covenant, they had a, a tent, a tabernacle, later a temple, and it was divided into two compartments. The first outer compartment was for the, the priest where they ministered and performed their services. But the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 7, but the high priest alone enters into the second room, or the second compartment, and that only once a year, and never without blood, and not without blood. See, today, many people say, well, I want God to bless me, not without blood. I want God to forgive me, not without blood. I want God to heal me, not without blood. I want God to prosper me, not without blood. I want him to strengthen me. I want him to guide me. I want him to help me, not without blood. Apart from the blood of Jesus Christ, God can do nothing for you. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Everybody sit down. Hallelujah. Are you out there today? Everything you need in life is found in the presence of God. Are you out there today? You see, when Moses was on Mount Sinai, he said, Lord, show me your glory. What he's really saying is, I want to see the manifestation of your presence. We know that God is omnipresent. There's nowhere that you can go to flee from his presence. We know that's true. But his presence is not always manifested everywhere. Isn't that right? I mean, is, is God living in this flower? No. Is God living in the chair you're sitting on? No. Understand that? But there are places where God dwells. If you're a believer, that's you. He dwells in you. Are you out there today? So God's, uh, Moses said to God, show me your glory. And God answered Moses this way. In Exodus 33, verse 19, he said, I will cause all of my goodness to pass in front of you. You see, the goodness of God is found in the presence of God. When you are in his presence, you are entering into all of his goodness. That means when you come into the presence of God, something good is going to happen to you. I do not believe you can be in the presence of God and remain unchanged. So look at the person sitting next to you and say, something good is going to happen to you. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now listen to this scripture, Psalm 16 and verse 11. Psalm 16, verse 11. It says, in your presence, in your presence, there is fullness of joy. <laughs> fullness of joy. That means it's impossible for you to stay sad in the glory of God. It's impossible for you to remain depressed in the presence of God. So if you need to brighten up, you need to get into the presence of God. Don't get mad at me. I didn't write the Bible. Hallelujah. Listen to Psalm 21, verse 6. You have made him exceedingly glad. You have made the king exceedingly glad with your presence. Whew. See, in God's presence, there's not just a little bit of happiness. There's fullness of joy. In other words, when you're really in the presence of God the way you should be, you don't just kind of stand there like a Presbyterian and kind of lift your toes a little bit and kind of go, no, no. <laughs> there, there's joy unspeakable and full of glory. So if you've been in the presence of God, it's no secret. I said, if you've been in the presence of God, it's no secret. Friend, don't, don't, don't come to me with that sad look on your face and that, and that long, sad, depressed countenance and tell me, I've been in the presence of God. No, you've been in somebody else's presence. You have not been in the presence of God. Come on, we're going to brighten up this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. How many of you need a little dose of joy? How many of you need more than a little dose of joy in your... Well, think about this. The Bible says the joy of the Lord 
is your strength. That means when you're discouraged, you're weak. I said when you're discouraged, you're weak. When you, spiritually. When you are sad, you are weak spiritually. So if you want some strength, you need to rejoice. And you need to get into the presence of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Listen to this scripture. Psalm 97, verse 5. The mountains melt like wax at the presence of the Lord. Ooh. <laughs> Problems dissolve. Obstacles are removed. Lives are transformed. How? By our theology? Pfft, wrong answer. By the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, don't misunderstand me. I'm a pastor, and I deal with people, and, and, and you know, Pastor Bill would certainly understand this, and, you know, and people have issues in their life, and I'm not opposed to counseling people, but I am opposed to this. I don't offer anyone private counsel who will not submit to public counsel. Are you listening to me? And a counseling session is not a substitute for your prayer life. And sometimes people don't need any counseling. Sometimes they just need to pray until they get into the presence of God and just let the glory of God burn some of those issues out of their lives because God can touch you exactly where you need to be touched. God can rearrange you. God can transform you. And He can do more for you. The glory of God can do more for you in five minutes than you could do for yourself in five years. Are you out there today? Hallelujah. Amen. So we need more of God's presence in our lives, more of God's presence in our, in our churches, in our, in our ministries. Let me read another scripture to you. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 37. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 37. It says, Moses was saying, God brought you out of Egypt by his presence and great power. God brought you out of Egypt by His presence and great power. That means God's presence is strong enough to permanently change your address. <laughs> you know, sometimes you can just feel like you're stuck in a place and nothing's going to change and it doesn't look like that there's any opportunities for you and say, well, my income is fixed, but God can unfix it. Hallelujah. Maybe it looks like there's no opportunities for you, but he said, I am he that openeth and no man shutteth. Hallelujah. The presence of God can change the scenery in your life. Maybe you're just sick and tired of looking at the same old, same old every day and you know in your heart that God's got something more for for you, something better for you. You know in your heart that God didn't call you to be living a life of bondage in Egypt. He's called you to go into the promised land. But notice God said here, my presence brought you out of Egypt. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Not only will God's presence take you out, God's presence will bring you in. It'll take you into your inheritance. It, he, they were guided by a pillar of fire. They were guided by a pillar of cloud. The presence of God, the glory of God, brought them into their inheritance. And He'll do the same thing for us. Are you listening to me today? Don't stare at me like a bunch of Presbyterians. Are you listening to me today? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. We know this scripture, I'm sure. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Let me read this from the New English translation. It says this, And where the Spirit of the Lord is present, there is freedom. Well, that would be the presence of God, wouldn't it? Where the Spirit of the Lord is present, there is freedom. Whew. We'll read it again. That means chains break off in His presence. Hallelujah. Paul and Silas found that out, didn't they? What did they do in the darkest moment of their life? Whine and complain about it. Friend, if you could get your miracle by complaining, you would have had it two years ago. <laughs> they began to pray, but that's not all. They began to sing praises unto God. Hallelujah. Amen. And the prisoners heard them. They didn't just kind of whisper, praise the Lord. They were, they were singing out loud. They didn't care. Hallelujah. Friends, when you're in the darkest dungeon and your back is bleeding, they've thrown away the key. You need to stop worrying about what other people think about you. Isn't that right? <laughs> the prisoners heard them, but that's not all. God heard them. 
and the presence of God. God inhabits the praises of His people. God doesn't inhabit the blank stares of His people. He inhabits the praises of His people. They gave God something to inhabit. The presence of God came on the scene and that place began to shake. Chains fell off. Prison doors were open. Glory to God. We need that kind of praise. We need that kind of liberation today in our lives and in our churches. Can you say amen? You cannot stay bound in his presence. Glory to God. I mean, if you want to stay a prisoner, you're going to have to try real hard. <laughs> Amen. Glory to God. So here we see in the scriptures, therefore, brothers, since we have boldness, say it again, boldness. We have boldness to enter the holy of holies by the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is the key that unlocks heaven's gates. Only the blood qualifies a man to stand in the presence of God without any guilt or shame. Now, I was reading this last night. Fort Knox, Kentucky is considered, I've never been there, Fort Knox, Kentucky is considered one of the most secure places on earth because, as you may know, that is the depository for much of the U.S. government's gold bullion. Their gold is there. It is a, in the middle of this uh, army camp, there is a fortress that contains approximately 5,000, I'd guess, I haven't been there lately, 5,000 tons of gold, which they say is about 3% of all of the gold that has ever been mined and refined in human history. So that's a fair amount of gold. In fact, this place is so secure, even during World War II, the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution was stored in Fort Knox. That's a safe place, see. The uh, Fort Knox is a, has massive granite walls, a bomb-proof roof, and it's sealed with a 22-ton door. How'd you like to open that? 22-ton door, amen, and the fortress sits in the middle of a 100,000-acre army camp, which is home to some 30,000 soldiers. So even if you did steal the gold, you got 30,000 soldiers to deal with. And it's guarded by Apache helicopters. It's considered one of the... And, the, and the, no one man has the combination to the vault. Ten different individuals have a part of it. So it takes 10 of them to come together to put in their parts before that door can be opened. But there's another place that was even more secure than Fort Knox. You see, Fort Knox holds gold. But the Holy of Holies held God. The walls in Fort Knox are there to protect the gold. But the curtains and the, and, the, and the draperies of the tabernacle didn't protect God. He doesn't need to be protected by us. It protected sinful man. Are you listening to me? You see, sin cannot exist before the Shekinah glory of God. Uncleanness cannot stand in the presence of God. In fact, there are cases, for example, a man carelessly touched the Ark of the Covenant and he dropped dead instantly. And that kind of spoiled the party. David had to go back. Uh, there's another case where the Philistines, they stole the Ark of the Covenant, which is symbolic, not only of the covenant, but the glory of God. They stole it and they, and they put it. See, to them it was just an artifact. It was a, a religious piece of furniture. They stuck it in their temple next to their statue of their God. When they came in the morning, the statue of their God had bowed down, fallen to the ground before the Ark of the Covenant. Hallelujah. The hills melt like wax. Glory to God. In Leviticus chapter 10, two of Aaron's sons, evidently they, they had been drinking Sometimes when you're involved, even in ministry, you can begin to become too familiar with the things of God. And the Bible says they offered strange fire to the Lord. One translation says, you know, unauthorized fire before the Lord. 
but then some authorized fire came out. <laughs> fire came out from the presence of God and consumed them. In other words, access at denied. <laughs> Are you listening to me? See, the Bible says in Psalm 24, verse 3 and 4, Who may ascend to the mountain of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? The answer is given. He who has clean hands and a pure heart. But the problem is this. You really can't cleanse your own hands and you can't purify your own heart. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, it says, Hebrews 9, 22, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. See, there's people today, and they just kind of preach a, uh, you know, God is nice, and he's good, and he doesn't want to hurt anybody, and yeah, yeah, and he just wants everybody to be blessed, and everything like that, and yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with that, but here's the problem. If your religion is bloodless, it's also powerless. When I say religion, you know what I mean. Are you out there today? Hallelujah. So the high priests of the Old Testament, they entered into, we could say it's the most secure place on earth. And the combination that opened the vault was the blood. They offered the blood of an animal sacrifice. They entered into a tabernacle that was made with human hands. But that was only a picture. The Bible says it. It was only a picture, a model. Evidently, on Mount Sinai, God showed Moses a picture or a model and said to him, make sure that you make this tabernacle according to the pattern showed to you on the mountain. It was a picture of heaven. It was a picture of the throne of God. Jesus did not enter into the temple of Jerusalem. He entered into heaven itself. And he did not bring the blood of a goat or a bull or another animal. He came with his own precious blood, the spotless blood of the Son of God. And he entered into heaven itself to redeem us, to pay the price, hallelujah, so that we could have boldness to come into the presence of God. The sacrifices of the Old Testament, they only covered sins. In fact, in the Old Testament, you read the word atonement. It's a common word. In fact, the day when the high priest came behind the veil was called the day of atonement. But the Hebrew word for atonement means to cover. To cover. But the blood of Jesus today does not cover your sins. It washes your sins away. And there's a big difference. You need to know that. You see, if I have a stain on my shirt, you know, maybe I've spilled some, some juice or something, I could take a cloth patch and stitch it over the area, and now it's covered. Not very adequately. You, you, from a distance, you don't see it. Maybe, maybe, you know, next to me you notice something's funny, but you can't see what's being covered. But it's still there. But a better solution would be I'll take that shirt and I'll, and I'll put it in a bucket of water and I'm going to wash that shirt. Now the, the stain isn't covered. It's dissolved. It's removed. It's not there anymore. You see, I, I can put my hand in the bucket and pull out the shirt, but I can't put my other hand in the bucket and pull out the stain. It's just not there anymore. When God forgives us, friends, He doesn't just say, I'll pretend this never happened, and, and when I see you, I won't bring it up. The stain has been washed away. He doesn't see your sin because it's not there. Are you listening to me? Hallelujah. You know, sometimes... You know, maybe my wife watch it, washes my clothes and, and you can still kind of make out there's a little something that didn't quite, didn't quite come out there. But the blood of Jesus is so powerful. There's, not only is the stain gone, the bad smell is gone too. You know, because some people, they go to church and they say, oh, I know the Lord forgave me, but I'm going to sit on the back row and I'm not going to smile or shake hands with anybody. And they still have a kind of an air, you know, that, that something's wrong. A little a smell of condemnation is still on them. But friends, 
friends, glory to God, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. There's no smell of sin in your life. You have that new car smell, glory to God. And if you do sin as a believer, you, when you mess up, you just simply fess up. When you fall, you fall at His feet. Don't run from Him. You run to Him. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. Glory to God. That means even if you have really royally messed up, if you will just come to Him and repent, glory to God, then you can have boldness again. Hallelujah! Woo. I don't know about you, I'm getting happy. Glory to God. So Smith Wigglesworth, Smith Wigglesworth, great man of faith, said, I find by the revelation of the Spirit that there is not one thing in me that the blood does not cleanse. There's not one thing in me that the blood does not cleanse. Hallelujah. See, sometimes people, Christians, they've done something wrong. Their heart convicts them. They know that. And they even ask God to forgive them. But then they try to punish themselves. See, they say, well, maybe I need to fast for three weeks. Or maybe, you know, I should just, uh, I shouldn't participate in any, I shouldn't even worship. When everybody else worships, I'll be in the, in the bathroom or I'll be in the hallway or or they, they somehow they're, you know, they're trying to punish themselves. And in their mind, they think that's the right thing to do. That, 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 that seems appropriate. What you don't know is you are insulting the blood. Because what you are saying is, I appreciate the cross, and I thank you for the blood, but I need a little something extra to really take care of my situation. No greater insult could be given to Jesus than to say that. You're not forgiven because you skipped a couple of meals. <laughs> You're not forgiven because you sat on the back row and didn't smile. <laughs> You're not forgiven because, you know, you, you lay down on the floor all night long and bawled and squalled and, and, and had a fit. The price for your forgiveness was none of those things. It was the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's all you need. And that's all you need to get. So if you are forgiven, you are forgiven. And you honor God by saying, I believe that. And I receive it. And I'm going to act like it's true. That's honoring God. And the attitude that we have is not that, well, I'm somebody really great. The attitude that we have is, well, everybody does it. Uh, the pastor understands. No, the attitude we have is gratitude. Gratitude. Thank you for the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And we have boldness because of the blood. Are you here today? Notice again in Hebrews chapter 10, it says, by a new and living way. New and living way. See, he's contrasting that with the Old Testament. By a new and living way that he has inaugurated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. You know, the Bible tells me that when Jesus hung on the cross and he... With his last breath, he breathed out, it is finished. And at that moment, that curtain, that veil that separated that inner compartment from the rest of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom. It was not done with human hands. Now, that didn't happen so that God could get out. God didn't need to do that. That happened so that we could see we can come in. Are you listening to me? Have you ever been to a grand opening, like a, some kind of a business, some shop, bank, or some public building that's now a grand museum, library, grand opening, and, you know, typically we, you know, will gather together at the door, right? And, you know, people will say some things, and, and often you'll see like a, a big red ribbon stretched across the door, and then there'll be some person that's chosen, some dignitary, some celebrity, someone special. They don't usually just pick anybody off the street. And this person will cut that ribbon, and now everybody can go in. That's what Jesus did. Heaven had a grand opening because there's a red ribbon that runs through our Bible. It's the blood. From the very beginning, from the very Garden of Eden, we can see this starlit thread of blood. We can see it in the sacrifices of men from the Old Testament. We even see it symbolized by a red cord which Rahab the harlot fixed to her window and the spies escaped from Jericho. We see this scarlet thread throughout the entire New Testament, all of Old Testament, a picture 
which leads us to the blood of Jesus Christ. And on that day, when his blood was shed, and he made the sacrifice in heaven itself, heaven had a grand opening. And now everyone can enter in by the blood. Are you out there today? Can I get an amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. And Lotus, it says this. This is something else we have. Verse 21. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God. Let me say something. Most churches preach about Jesus' earthly ministry. Very few preach about his heavenly ministry. Most Christians know what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. They have no idea what he's doing now. As far as they're concerned, they say, well, he's seated at the Father's right hand. But in their mind, he's just like taking a break. He said, okay, whew, glad that's all over with. And I'm just going to hang out here and play Nintendo until it's time to go back down there. No, 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 no. He has a high priestly ministry right now. See, most Christians, I'm sure all Christians know that on the cross, Jesus was representing us. He took our place. But what they don't realize is at the Father's right hand, He's still representing you as your high priest. You see, before the Father, He is your advocate. He is your intercessor. He is your mediator. That's why He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. Are you out there today? You see, His present day ministry is just as important as His earthly ministry was. And what he's doing now is just as important as what he did 2,000 years ago. Because if he didn't have his present day ministry, then his earthly ministry would have no effect. We have a high priest. Isn't it good to know you've got friends in high places? <laughs> that, means, that means, you know, there is an accuser of the brethren, the, the devil. The devil will, will try to put you in a place of condemnation. And if you sin, of course, your heart is convicted of wrongdoing. And, and you stand before the throne of God, the righteous judge, but you have an advocate with the Father. And what he's saying is, I died for him. I took her place. Her sin was placed upon me. I bore the punishment into hell itself. And because of that, God doesn't say, okay, we'll forgive you. God says, not guilty. Amen. Hallelujah. Because of the blood. Hallelujah. We have a high priest at the Father's right hand. So notice this. Notice verse 22. It says, let us draw near. You know, it's one thing to know you have something. It's another thing to know what to do with it. And sometimes we hear sermons about this is what belongs to me, this is what I have in Christ, and I think that we need to go one step further because people need to know, all right, now what does that actually mean in my daily life? What do I do with what I have? You may tell me that I'm the righteousness of God in Christ, but what does that look like on Monday morning? You may tell me, you know, hallelujah, that, that, that I've been sanctified by His blood, but what does that actually look like in my daily life? What do I do right now? And we actually need to know what we have, but then we need to know what to do. And He tells us right here, let us draw near. That means approach. That means come forward. That means come closer. Think about it. The, the writer of Hebrews, I believe it's Paul, he's writing to Christians. He's not writing to sinners. They have the presence of God inside of them because God by the Holy Spirit is living inside of them. And yet he's telling these people, spirit-filled Christians, you need to come closer. Is it possible for us to draw near to the presence of God? That's like a yes or no question. Is that, is that possible to draw near to the presence of God? Is it possible for us to be closer to his presence? Is that possible for us? Or is this it? This is what we got. That's all there is. No, it's possible. If it's possible for us to be closer to his presence, that means it's also possible for us to be further away. I didn't say you're not saved. I didn't say you're not going to heaven. But I said you're missing out on the opportunity you have. 
this, this, these, these next verses, they say, let us, let us, let us. He's not commanding them. He's not trying to intimidate them. He's not saying, now, if you don't do this, you're going to hell or you, God's going to curse you. He, he's, he's not trying to threaten us. He's speaking as a fellow Christian. It's the Holy Spirit through the writer speaking to us saying, you have this opportunity. Take advantage of it. Let's do this. He's encouraging us to do this. Hallelujah. So that means his presence can be stronger in our life. His presence, see, if something is manifested, that means that the, the spiritual realm is now intruding into the natural realm. We would call that supernatural. That means something that is invisible now becomes visible. Something inaudible now becomes audible. Something intangible now becomes tangible. See, God's in this room. God, God's here with us. He, there's no way you can go from him. But that, that, that's, not, that's not what we're talking about. We want an intrusion into the natural realm where you can actually, the Old Testament, the children of Israel, they saw with their eyes, they weren't born again, they saw the glory of God descend on Mount Sinai. The Bible says the whole mountain shook and smoke went up like a furnace from that place. It should be when people come in our homes, they can sense the presence of God. In fact, the Apostle Paul says it should be that if those who are unbelievers or unlearned come in among us because the manifestation of God's Spirit, they're going to fall down on their face and report, truly God is among you. You're listening to me. Draw near. I, um, I heard the testimony about uh, from the man John Bevere. He's written several books. He's a fine Christian minister, John Bevere. And I remember he said that uh, he used to work in a large church in, I believe, the state of Florida. And his responsibility was picking up guest ministers and taking them uh, to the church and bringing them back to their hotel, etc. And rather candidly, he shared this. And I thought it was interesting, kind of like, you know, behind the scenes comment. But he said, to be honest with you, most of our guest speakers, when I picked them up, it was just kind of like, you know, it's okay. You know, and, you know, no problem, you know, just kind of just doing their thing. But he said, in all those years, there were only two people. That's what he said. Only two people, when they got in the car, I felt the presence of God get in that car too. And he said, one was, was Jeannie Wilkerson, who was a woman who lived in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Brother Hagen said, called her a prophet, said she stood in that office, the woman of prayer. And he said, the other one was Paul Young E. Cho. And he said, one thing about it, I, I knew it was God's presence because when they got in the car and sat in the back seat, I couldn't help it, but I began to weep. Just began to weep. What is it Fra St. Francis of Assisi said? Preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. <laughs> well, you can't preach the gospel without words. Don't misunderstand me. But the point is this. People need more than information. Yeah. They need yeah. demonstration. Yeah. They need to see it. They need to sense it. Are you out there today? If we don't draw near continually, others won't draw near either. Are you listening? I want to just focus on verse 22 because my time is nearly over. How do we? We have, this, we have this opportunity. How do we enter into God's presence? It's found in verse 22. It's right here. He says, number one, let us draw near with a true heart. A true heart. Not with a thick head, but a true heart. Because God is a spirit. And when the Bible talks about your heart, I'm sure you know it's not talking about the organ in your body that's pumping blood. It's talking about your inward man. So you're not going to contact God with your intelligence. Did you know that God is smarter than you? <laughs> Did you realize that he's not impressed with your intelligence? Even if you know a lot of scriptures, do you realize that's good? Don't misunderstand me. I mean, that's what we're trying to do now is teach the scriptures. But do you realize that you're not going to impress God with your knowledge of the Bible? Uh, friend, he wrote the Bible, <laughs> right? 
Jesus is the word. Amen. Hallelujah. But we draw near with a true heart. Amen. Now, when I say heart, I'm not talking about some deep feelings that you have, like country and Western music. She broke my heart and stole my truck. What I'm talking about is your inward man, the part of you that has received Christ and has eternal life on the inside of you. Sometimes it takes people a little, a little while to get their head quieted down so their heart can rise to the ascendancy. Their spirit man can be stronger. Sometimes it takes a, a little bit of time because we've been out of practice. One benefit of praying in tongues is that it's not a mental activity. It's a spiritual activity, and it helps your mind to become settled and quiet. Sometimes you just need to be still before the Lord. Amen. What is it? I heard uh, Kenneth Copeland many years ago. He was just saved, a, a young Christian. And so he's praying. You know, every day he's praying, praying up a storm, as we say. And he said one day he had this thought. He said, now here are two individuals. One of them is full of all wisdom. He knows everything. And then the other person, he really doesn't know anything. And the one that doesn't know anything is doing all the talking. <laughs> Did your lightning fast mind catch that? <laughs> so, so he said, Lord, I'm just going to be quiet for a moment. And he said, inside my heart, I heard the Holy Spirit say, finally, I thought you would never shut up. <laughs> That's what my wife says to me all the time. Praise the Lord. So we draw near with our spirit man. But notice he says, with a true heart. The word true also means sincere. I'd like to say this to you. You have to be honest before God. You might as well, because uh, he knows you better than you know yourself. And he knows what you're thinking anyways. Uh, and sometimes we say a bunch of stuff that's insincere, and that's part of the problem. And I'm not talking about you. I mean all the people that didn't come this morning. But I remember years ago when I was a student in Bible school and we were playing a game of volleyball and I had a, like a heart attack. I don't mean that my heart stopped beating. It was the opposite. I'd, I'd been diagnosed with this condition years before that where some, some things would trigger something in my, hearts, in my heart and, uh, and my heart would palpitate. It's beating extremely fast, like, like, you know, as fast as machine gun bullets. Ba 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 ba. You know, it feels like it's going to pop right out of my chest. And of course, you know, I, my eyes vision got a little blurry, and my head, I'm so sweating profusely. You feel faint and everything. And it, these these attacks occurred a few times, and they lasted. Sometimes they lasted upwards of an hour. And the doctor told me to do certain things and blah, blah, blah. But now I'm in Bible school and, I, and I'm learning the word of God. And so while we're playing this game, this, 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 this attack came. And so I kind of, you know, didn't want to make a scene or something. So I kind of excused myself, went into a side room. And so there I'm praying, right? And I, I said everything I'd ever heard anybody say. You know, I bound this, I loosed that, I rebuked the devil, I quoted this scripture, I quoted that scripture, I, I did this, I did that. See, most of the time, the problem is we learn by imitation and not by inspiration. Don't misunderstand me. It's good to follow the examples of others, but you're not, a, you're not just supposed to insincerely copy what others are saying. You need to know what you're saying. By the way, the devil knows if you know what you're saying or not. <laughs> And, and so I went through all of that stuff, and no change. My heart is still just beating rapidly, you know. And then, I guess, out of desperation, and this came from my heart inside of me. I just looked up to heaven, and I said, Lord, have mercy on me. And just like that, I mean, the words just had left my mouth when every symptom stopped. And I learned something that day. God does not appreciate insincerity, no matter how scriptural it sounds. He knows when you're lying. <laughs> Are you listening to me? I mean, I, I'd like to tell you this. You can pray about this, think about this. But if you're angry, you might just tell the Lord, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm ticked off. 
<laughs> he knows it anyways. You might as well just tell him. <laughs> Isn't that right? If you, and, and, you know, by the way, if you need something, why beat around the bush and dance around it? If, if really what you need is a husband, don't talk about the eternal plan of redemption. What you really need is a man. We all know that. <laughs> and man, if you need money to pay your rent, you might as well just tell him, actually, I need money to pay my rent. But that's not all. He says, let us come with a true heart, but that's not all, in full assurance of faith. See, some people are honest, but they don't have a molecule of faith. I mean, they're real honest. They'll just stand up every, do- every, every time they pray. They'll say, God, I'm feeling bad today, and nothing's working right in my life, and I guess nothing's going to change. And, well, they're being honest, but there's no faith in that. See, he said, this is how you come into the presence of God, with full assurance of faith. Now, so that means this is not just a belief or a tenet of faith. This is not just, he's not talking about some doctrine that's on a wall somewhere printed on the back of our bulletin. What he means is confidence, actual confidence that we have in our heart. In other words, when you pray, you know, Heavenly Father, you need to believe that in heaven God says, I hear you, my son. In the book of James, chapter 5, verse 16, it says, The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available. One time I asked the Lord, I said, What does that mean, effectual, fervent? And in my heart, I don't mean a thundering voice from the heavens, but in my heart, I heard the Spirit say to me, It means believing prayer. I think in the back of our minds, I can't speak for you, but I know myself, Sometimes there's this kind of thought in the back of your mind that, you know, I'm not sure if my words are even going past the ceiling. You know, I'm praying all this stuff, but maybe, maybe I'd really have to fast a long time and pray in tongues about eight hours or something like that, and then maybe, 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 maybe God would hear me. But you need to believe, because Jesus said, and whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. You need to understand that the Bible says if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. If you reach up, he's going to reach down. Are you listening to me? Full assurance of faith. I need to wrap this up. Having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. We would say a guilty conscience. I'll read the scripture to you in 1 John three twenty one. It says, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. See, That word condemn means you're convicted. You know in your heart that you've done wrong. Sin keeps us from having confidence in the presence of God. So if we've missed it, we need to turn to him and receive cleansing and forgiveness from him. One more thing I want to say to you. Back to the first verse we read. It says, therefore, having boldness. 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 And that word boldness in the Greek language actually means all outspokenness. It means not afraid to speak. That means you're going to get into the presence of God with your mouth. You're going to have to say something. You're going to have to declare some things. Are you listening to me? You cannot be mute and enter into the presence of God. The Bible says enter into his gates with and into his courts with, well, we're not even talking about the throne. We're talking about the gate now. We still got to keep going to get to the throne. Amen. But that means you got to open your mouth. You got to say something. You got to declare something. You got to put the word of God in your mouth. Are you out there today? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Everything you need is in the presence of the Lord. And you have boldness. Boldness. Would you stand with me to your